There's a term out there now called tea and scone stewardship, which is essentially meeting with, you know, a, 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 an investor, meeting with the company, uh, having a nice conversation, asking them for, uh, for change um, in some respect. And then the company says, thanks very much. They say it very friendly over a cup of tea. And then a year later, they go on, on and have the exact same conversation, no change. Welcome to The Green Away. I'm your host, Rosemary Petrus, Senior Journalist at FS Sustainability. We are recording on Gadigal land and we pay our respects to traditional custodians of country and elders past, present and emerging. Today we have Rachel Halpin on the show to talk about responsible investment stewardship. Welcome to the show, Rachel. Hey, good to be here. Thanks for having me. Rachel is the Head of Sustainability at Jana Investment Advisors. Rachel, what is stewardship? Uh, well, put simply, it's using investors' influence for change. Uh, that could be, you know, it's been around for a while uh, for um, improving financial outcomes, but also um, increasingly used for improving um, outcomes, real world performance outcomes, things like net zero and natural capital. In the context of ESG, is there something that particularly makes ESG stewardship different from stewardship in general? Well, like I was saying before, the stewardship's been around for a very long time uh, in the sense that it's use of investor influence to improve financial performance. And that might be reducing risk or identifying new opportunities. In terms of you know, ESG stewardship, it's, it's you understanding the issues that are perhaps not priced that result from environmental, social or governance factors mm-hmm. or... Um, real world outcomes that an investor is looking to target and talking to those companies about uh, meeting those targets. And when talking about working towards those net zero targets, how exactly is stewardship used to steer those companies towards transitioning to net zero? So it involves a deep skill set of understanding how the, the, the transition pathways for each industry. Mm-hmm and understanding the company as well. So you need to understand the issue deeply and what the available options are for the sector um, and the company within that sector and an understanding, having a really deep understanding of that company's opportunities um, in the context of that pathway. And stewardship can be corporate engagements, um, you know, bilateral. Mm -hmm. It can be collective engagements or it can be, uh, you know, with using collective action with other investors to talk to the company, or um, perhaps most usefully in net zero, it's actually advocacy. So talking to the government, talking to policy and regulators and um, identifying roadblocks for change at a systems level. Uh, One of the things that we're looking for is really important, I think, in a successful stewardship program when you're looking to steward specifically for net zero is to have a dual objective in that stewardship program. So um, to be really clear, make a really clear delineation between a stewardship program that already existed for climate risk mitigation for the Mm -hmm. financial outcomes for the portfolio. Uh, We've seen a lot of, I think, programs out there that have been awkwardly retrofitted uh, to claim that they are net zero stewardship programs when in fact they don't have a, they haven't set the formal objective that it's, that they've got a net zero objective for that stewardship program. Mm -hmm. And that really affects outcomes and it really affects the way, the objectives that you're looking to um, talk to the company about. Mm -hmm. And it affects the likelihood that that stewardship program will lead to actual emissions reduction as opposed to improved performance by mitigating climate risk. So it's not just engaging in companies that um, that, uh, an investor is invested in, but it's in general stakeholders more broadly? Well, it is certainly there's an I mean, for most institutional investors, it's in ga- identifying the material companies that the investor is invested in, um, that you know, where they can most usefully use their influence at the bilateral company mm-hmm. level, like invested a company level. And then where there are systemic blockers to change, um, there might be, for example, some investors out there who don't perceive oil and gas companies to be usefully engaged with mm-hmm. because there's systemic blockers at a regulatory level. So they might want to engage with the government instead of talking to the company because you only want to do something useful that actually you know, uh, leads to positive change. 
Are there some common misconceptions around this topic and kind of what it involves? I think that there's a misconception out there that it's generally done well. Okay. <laughs> it's not. It's just really, it's, it's an emerging area um, mm-hmm. and it, it requires more resources uh, and it's a completely different skill set than the traditional investor skill set. And uh, we do due diligence on a lot of fund managers and we're hoping to see improvements in, in the state of play because it's not done to the level that is going to deliver on asset owners' net zero commitments mm-hmm. as at current, current state. Well, in practical terms, what kind of specific practices could lead to an effective outcome? Can you give us some real life case studies? The Church of England's done this really well. The Church of England Pension Fund over in the UK, really clear, uh, engaging with oil and gas companies. They had a five-year program Mm -hmm. uh, of, of stewardship and they set that out to the companies in their portfolio at the outset that they were going to engage with them for that period. It was a time-bound period Mm -hmm. and it was well-resourced internally and they had the right expertise um, to understand the industry and 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 have developed really strong relationships with the internal stakeholders of the companies in which they were invested so that they could have meaningful conversations, not just with the investor relations team, but with the actual um, stakeholders within the companies who had the ability to execute on the things, on the asks, Mm -hmm. if you will. And then what you're looking for is um, setting of milestones, not just, um, you know, if at the five-year period, but, you know, interim milestones, milestones along the way mm-hmm. during that five-year period and, and an assessment um, at the end of that period as to whether or not it's working. And you'll see in the, in the press that the Church of England Pension Fund decided that it wasn't working. It wasn't a good use of their resources. And so they divested from the industry. So... If the engagement strategy isn't working, so the the answer would be divestment? Not in all cases, absolutely not. It just was, that was the Church of England Pension Fund's um, decision as a result of their their deep engagement with the companies that they held Mm -hmm. um, in their portfolio. Are there any kind of stewardship practices that do not achieve the the desired outcome? Um, You know, what happens when the stewardship practices do fall short and what's your opinion on, you know, what those specific strategies are? I think it's um, fairly well recognised and I'm not the only one in saying this. Um, There's a term out there now called tea and scone stewardship, which is essentially meeting with, you know, an investor, meeting with the company, uh, having a nice conversation, asking them for uh, for change um, in some respect and then the company says, thanks very much. They say it very friendly over a cup of tea. And then a year later, they go on and have the exact same conversation, no change. How can professionals kind of progress past those kind of tactics? Clear, clear documentation of expected milestones and escalation Mm -hmm. in advance. So ASIC is looking at active ownership best practice to prevent greenwashing. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, so active ownership is what ASIC typically, um, the phrase that they use when they talk about stewardship. And they've identified that stewardship is a component of many asset owners' net zero plans. Mm -hmm. And so they're looking at the the credibility of those net zero plans relies on the credibility of those stewardship programs. And so obviously a lot of asset owners and investors have made statements out to the market that um, about their net zero commitments. Mm -hmm. And so the primary function of the regulator at the moment um, in greenwashing is to ensure that they're taking action to ensure that those net zero claims and statements to the market are not misleading. And that goes to um, stewardship claims as well in the context of net zero plans. So that I think the regulator is going to be looking pretty closely and they've signaled and made noises over the past year that they're going to be looking to find evidence of really um, excellent but also poor performance of, of stewardship programs being deployed. So I'd, I would expect um, more resources um, needing to be thrown at stewardship in order to make good on the, on the commitments that have been made in the market. When do you think there will be an outcome from that? Uh, well, it's just, it's, they've signaled it as one of the things that they'll be looking for when they're looking for a greenwashing case, the enforcement. Okay. 
of in, in enforcement action. So I, I really don't know if and when they'll take an enforcement case. Okay. But the, generally, they may before they before they take an enforcement uh, case, they make noises to the market that that's what they're looking at. Okay. I used to be a regulator, um, so oh, I'm familiar really? with the practice. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time today, Rachel. Where can people connect with you and find out more about the work Jana is doing? We're at Jana. We advise institutional investors um, on all of their sustainability needs, including their net zero um, journeys and and how they and their approaches to stewardship. So, all that um, can be accessed via our website, uh, jana.com.au. Until next time, then I'm Rose Mary Petrus, and thank you for listening to the Green Away. The Green Away podcast is a product of FS Sustainability, a show about people, the planet, and investing in our collective future. All information in this podcast is for education and entertainment purposes only. The Green Away podcast gives listeners access to information and educational content provided by discussing numerous financial sustainable options and our featured guests. It is not intended as a substitute for professional, legal, or tax advice. The hosts of The Greener Way are not financial professionals and are not aware of your personal financial circumstances. Before making any financial decisions, you should read the product disclosure statement and if necessary, consult a licensed financial professional. For more information, head to the disclaimer page on the FS Sustainability website, fssustainability.com.au.